welcome 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 in this video we are going to be talking about options this is not going to be the most in-depth course that's just going to take a really long time and there's already people who've done a great job at that so if you're looking for like a full blown out course on options i'll drop some links in the description to courses that i personally would recommend but this is really going to be just me running down options very quickly and then kind of giving my personal thoughts on what i do and just really tailoring it towards my type of trading and just sharing that all with you guys so before we really get into examples and walkthroughs i'm just gonna give you like a basic introduction to options if you are new to them but even before i get into that please remember just like other types of tradings options are very risky um you can lose a lot of money if you're not doing it correctly even if you are doing it correctly and things don't work in your favor you can still you know have bad luck and take big l's so there is no cheat code to trading options just like anything else do involves risks nothing i say is financial advice and please do your own research so we're going to be talking about what options are how you can trade them my personal process and more but just to start off let's kind of just keep it simple and talk about what options are now on the forefront options are just contracts that give you rights you know buyer a comes to seller b and buyer a says hey in two weeks, I want the right to buy this certain asset at this certain price, regardless of what the current market price in two weeks will be. And seller B, who does not think that that's likely, will say, fine, I'll give you this contract. And in two weeks, you can buy this stock for this price, no matter what the current market price is at that time. And really, there's different types of contracts in options, depending on if they're calls or puts, if you're buying them, selling them, if you're using strategies, which are a lot more advanced. Um, which give you different types of profiting off of stocks going up, stocks going down, or even stocks doing nothing. Um, options are derivatives where, you know, similar to futures and stuff, you're betting on the future of a stock. You have buyers and sellers. This is own market um, based on contracts. So when you are entering in an option contract, basically each contract that you buy, if you're buying calls, will be equal to 100 shares and that's going to be important if you want to exercise your options but it also just displays the higher volatility that you will have trading options right a stock price for example could move like two or three percent but the options for that stock could move up like 30 percent and that's really where the leverage comes into play um and we'll talk more about that when we talk about exercising but just to really summarize it you're betting on a stock to move a certain amount of price by a certain amount of time if you're buying or selling calls or if you're buying or selling puts i'm not really going to dive deep into you know the iron condors and the straddles and all that stuff you can check out the links in the description for that but really i use options as trading tools other people might use it to hedge positions other people might use it to actually exercise them and buy the underlying stock there's a lot of ways you can use options but personally i just trade them um, based on the premium which we will also talk about and to you know to make that more clear how do you trade these options well there's four main ways to trade them unless you're doing spreads which again we're not going to really go over and those four main ways are buying a call buying a put selling a call or selling a put so you have calls and puts um basically if you're going to be buying a call you're giving out a strong bet that the price will go up when you do that you have unlimited profit, but you risk all the money that you're putting into that contract or into all the contracts that you get. When you're buying a put, it's the opposite. It means you're get pretty much giving a strong bet on the price going down, which again, you have unlimited profit if you're correct, but you do also risk all the money you put into those contracts. Now, selling a call and selling a put's a little bit different. Personally, I don't sell calls and puts, um, but it's really where you're not betting as strongly for the price to go up or down when you're selling calls and puts but you're just collecting the premiums um, from the buyer. So let's say um, the premium of, an, premium of an option, which I'm going to really explain premiums in a little bit, but let's say an option is worth a dollar. And if you're buying that option, if you're buying a call on that option, you're saying that you think the price of the underlying asset will go up. So if you're correct about that and you're buying a call, the $1 premium on those options can go up to $2 and you double your money. Now, if you're selling a call, it's pretty much the opposite, where you're thinking that the call will go down. The premium of that call or how much that call is worth will go down. So if the price of the underlying asset does not go up or the time decay kind of comes into effect, which we'll talk about, and you sell a call, 
then you're collecting the premium from the buyers. So again, it's a different market. So somebody has to make money and somebody has to lose money. So when you're selling a call and selling a put, you're just getting a fixed profit. You're collecting premiums based on the people who are losing money that were longing the calls and the puts. Um, when you're selling a call, it's pretty much a medium bet. You're getting a fixed profit. And when you're selling a put, it's again, a medium bet. You're getting a fixed profit. Typically, um, selling a call will be bearish and selling a put will be bullish. Um, and if you don't understand how stocks work, this is definitely not a video for you yet. Please watch the beginning of the course um, before you really get into options. You really need to understand how to trade stocks, how to use technicals, how to manage risk before you even start off with options, right? And then a final point on selling calls and puts. They can be very dangerous um, if you're doing it naked, which means if you don't actually cover those calls and puts by owning the underlying asset, pretty much 100 shares per contract, it really can create a lot of risk. So please do your research on them. I'm not even going to really talk about them more because I don't do it personally, but do your own research there. And then finally, you have spreads, which are pretty much, you know, the straddles and the iron condors and all those things where you can really bet in different ways by getting a fixed amount of contracts and puts and calls and selling them and just using them in different ways, um, which again, not going to be covering this video. Check out the links in the description. But to put it simply, you can even put on greater risk, you can put on less rewards, you can really just optimize the contracts to whatever suits you the best. Um, you can even bet on the price doing nothing and just collect premiums from people who are betting on the price to move. So there's so many different ways to trade these options and it just opens up a new world to stocks. Instead of buying low and selling high, you can do so many different things with an underlying asset using options. Now with options and actually getting into positions, you're going to have a certain amount of contracts that you might want to be trading. So each contract that you get will be worth, you know, and I'm going to put like a quotation on this worth 100 shares. So if you get two contracts, that's the equivalent to 200 shares of that stock. Now, if you're trading and you're just buying and selling the premium of those options, it doesn't matter what the underlying shares are. But you need to keep that in mind, especially when it comes to in the money options, out of money options, which I'm going to talk about in a second and exercising options, which is the next point. So you can trade options, which is basically you're just trading how much the options are worth, or you can actually exercise them. Um, now, typically, actually, personally, I never exercise options. Some people do. And let me just go to the next slide. Let's say we have this Apple option, right? Where the current price of Apple is about $128. And you see this option, which allows you to pretty much have a $130 call on Apple for May 21st. If by May 21st, Apple is above 130, basically for every contract you had, you can get 100 shares of Apple at that higher price. So if Apple goes from 128 to 132 by May 21st, you can exercise your calls and you can pretty much buy Apple below the market price on May 21st or whatever date it gets in the money. Um, and that's good for some people. For most people, they just like trading the options and taking the profit that they made on the premium. But again, if you want to learn more about exercising options, check out the link in the description. And I'm going to come back to these screenshots in a second, but I've probably said a few terms that you don't really understand if you're new to options. So let me just quickly give you all the options terms that you need to know. The first one is strike price. The strike price is the price at which you can exercise your option and it, you don't really typically exercise your option. Well, at least most traders don't. You just take your profits and you trade around them. But this is important because it's, again, the price that you're trading around is so you're pretty much your target price, um, not necessarily for selling, but just what you're looking for to happen. So let's say you're buying this call on Apple and the strike price is 130, but the current price is 128. Basically, you want Apple to go above 130 by May 21st. And I'm going to talk about the expiration date in a second, but the strike price, when you're getting a call, you want it to be above that because you're bullish on the stock. And when you're getting a put, you want it to be below the strike price. So if Apple is 128 and the strike price is 125, you want Apple to go under 125 by that date if you're getting a put or if you're buying a put. So just like I talked about the expiration date, it's just the date by which the options are pretty much over. That contract is void and you take your profits, you cut your loss, you exercise, however you want to exit those options is up to you. Um, and if you don't really do anything and you're wrong and let's say you had calls and Apple never went above 130, then those options will expire worthless. 
So that's really where you can lose a lot of money because if you put in, let's say, $1,000 into Apple calls for $130 by May 21st, and on May 21st it was only at $129, you lose all of your $1,000 because you were incorrect. And that's really the thing with options. Not only do you have to be correct about where the price is going to go, you have to be correct on the timing. So really keep that in mind. Um, and I was just talking about the premium price, which is the next one. That's just the price at which the option is trading. So you can see we have these 130 Apple calls and this premium price is 65 cents. So if you get into these calls at 65 cents um, and you sell them or you take profits on them at 75 cents, then you just made 10 cents um, premium profit in option or a contract. And that's really where you trade them and that's how you make your money off of them. So let's say for an example, Apple is at 128 and it goes up to 130, which is your strike price you're pretty much going to be making that profit where you can realize gains based on the premium. Um, but if it goes the opposite way and Apple goes down and it never gets to your strike price, these will start losing value. And maybe you cut your losses when this was at 55 cents and then you lose 10 cents a contract on that premium. So the premium is really just like, think about it as the stock price for the options. It's not the actual stock price, which here would be 127.79 on Apple. It's the price of this option. It's how much the option is currently worth. And a lot of things affect that, which we're going to be talking about shortly. So the next thing is the open interest. That's pretty much it's very simple. It's the number of people who are currently in those options. So the amount of people that are currently in these Apple puts are 41,000. The amount of people in these Apple calls are 68,000. And the volume is pretty much how many people have traded that option. Um, so it just tells you, you know, today, how many people were buying or selling or just doing something with that option. And those are just telling you um, how much volume is in the options. Typically, the higher those numbers are, the closer the limit price will be because a lot of people will want it to be buying it somewhere and selling it somewhere at the same time. Um, but if you enter an option, let's say on a small cap stock, where it's a very small volume and open interest, you might have very wide spreads, which means you might have to be buying it at five to 10 cent increments. You might have to be selling it at 20 cent increments, which that really leads to a lot of volatility. So you want to be very, very careful with that, um, especially if you're a beginner in options. The next thing is implied volatility. This is very, very important. That pretty much just means how people are expecting the price to move. If something has a low implied volatility, people do not think that the price of the underlying stock um, will be moving that quickly. If you do have a high implied volatility, that means people think the price is going to be going up and down very, very fast, very, very frequently. So if you look at Apple, you have a 25% implied volatility. That's relatively low. But if you were to have looked at GameStop's implied volatility when it was going crazy um, with Wall Street bets and everything, it was probably 200%, which means people were obviously thinking that it was going to be going up and down very, very fast. And that really affects the premium prices of the option because if you are entering a stock with a very low implied volatility and it makes a big move that can actually really raise up those premiums a lot because nobody was really expecting it to make a huge move um, because the implied volatility was low and, and you can make a lot of money but if you let's say entered GameStop options and the implied volatility was 200% um, and then you can start losing money little by little if it's not doing as much as people hoped it were, would do. So if you if you were in GameStop calls for $500 strike prices uh, a couple months ago when it was going wild and the IV was super, super high, but, the, but then GameStop stopped going up, not only were you losing just because your options were decreasing, like it was pretty much a multiplier effect because people were so confident in the price going crazy and it didn't. And that's pretty much an IV crush where the implied volatility starts going back down and people are losing a lot of money and it's not great. And that's really another thing that's very typical with earnings where the implied volatility will be very, very, the actual number of implied volatility will be volatile itself, um, which can again affect the premium of, this, of these options. So please remember when you're trading options, it is not just the stock price that matters. There are so many other factors that can affect the prices of those options that you need to be aware of. And the other you know, ones I wanna talk about are the Greeks, which are these things at the bottom um and there's the delta the gamma the theta the vega the rho personally i mainly just look at the delta and the theta based on how i trade options but it is important to know how all of these work um so if we just take a look at them 
The delta represents the sensitivity of an option's price based on the value of the underlying security or the stock. So let's say you have a delta of 0.27 on these Apple calls. That pretty much means for every dollar that Apple goes up in the actual stock price, these, these options will increase by 0.27. So if Apple goes up to 128.79, theoretically, these premiums from 65 cents will increase another 27 cents. And that's how you make your profit. Um, and this does change, the delta will go higher and lower and that's really determined by the gamma, which represents the rate of change on the delta. So you also want to be looking at the gamma if you want to try and anticipate um, how much the actual delta will change. There's just so much info that you get off of these that you really need to learn from. Um, then you also have the theta, which is time decay. This is very, very important. So, and like I said, you need to be correct about not only how much the stock will move, but the timing on it. So if you, over here, the theta is 11 cents a day, Let's say tomorrow Apple opens up and it does literally nothing all day. It just stays the same. These 65 cent premiums will lose 11 cents, okay? Not because the price did not go up. You were betting that the price was going to go up and it didn't, it just stayed the same. And you lose money when that happens if you're longing a call. Or on the other hand, even if you're longing a put and you're betting on the price to go down, but the price does nothing, this theta is about negative 14 cents, you're gonna be losing that 14 cents on this 89 cent premium. So if you're entering an option um, and you're just longing a call or a put and the price does nothing, you will be losing money based on the theta crush. So also keep that in mind. Next, let's talk about the vega. It just represents the option sensitivity to volatility or that implied volatility. So keep that in mind as well. And then the row represents how sensitive the price of an option is relative to the interest rates. I really never use that. Um, but for, especially for more longer term investors and on the, like the large cap names, that's probably pretty important. But again, check out the links in the description if you want to get more in depth on those things. Let's kind of finish off the slideshow and I'm going to show you some examples. Um, the risks and reward of options, like I just talked about the time decay, that theta going down. If the stock does nothing, but you said the stock was going to go up or down, you're going to lose money. So you need to be correct about where the price is going to be going by when. Next is the IV crush, like I also talked about. Let's say GameStop had a 200% implied volatility and it just did nothing. You'd be losing a lot because people were really thinking it was going to do something. Um, another risk is, expi if, is your options expiring out of the money. So like I also talked about, just to summarize, let's say you got these Apple calls where the price of Apple at the time was 128, but you got a strike price for 130 by May 21st. And on May 21st, Apple was 129. Even though the price of Apple rose, it did not rise as much as you thought it would. And that's going to actually make your options expire worthless. So the price of Apple actually went up, but it did not go up as much as you said it would. And since your options are expiring out of the money, you're going to lose all the premium that you put into those options. The premiums will expire worthless because they're not in the money. And I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but in the money and out of the money, very simple. Basically, if the current stock price is above the strike price, you're in the money. If the current stock price is below the strike price, you're out of the money. Um, and that's very important um, because when your option is on the expiration date, you want it to be, if you're buying a call, you want it to be above the strike price. And if you're buying a put, you want it to be below the strike price. So if you're getting these Apple puts, you want it to be under 125. Um, typically, out of the money options will be more higher risk, higher reward. So really... Um, if you get a short term expiration date that's out of the money, you can make a lot of money very quickly or lose a lot of money very quickly. And then if you want to be a little bit safer, you can get in the money options, which means you're already above the strike price if you're buying a call or you're already below the strike price if you're buying a put. And that's going to lower your risk, but also lower your reward. Not a crazy amount, but a decent amount. And then also the expiration date, like I talked about earlier. The further out your expiration date is, the more time you have to be correct, which will lower your risk, but again, lower your reward. Um, but another thing that I want to talk about is the premium decrease. That's kind of what we talked about before, but just remember, it's not the actual stock price that matters when you're trading options. It's the premium price that matters. And so many things affect that premium decreasing or increasing, such as the stock price, the theta, the delta, the gamma, the implied volatility, um, and everything like that. Now, what are the rewards on options? The profit that you can make on your premium, which is pretty much the opposite of the decrease. 
um, exercising the options in your favor. For an example, if you want to exercise these Apple calls, you can. Let's say it's at 131 on May 21st. You can exercise your options and for every contract you held, you can buy 100 shares of Apple at 130 instead of the current market price of 131, which means that you're already making a dollar in profit on each share of Apple. And exercising your favor, then we have hedging. Um, that's great, especially if you're selling calls and puts. Basically, let's say you own a large position in a stock and actual equity shares. You can hedge against your own position by selling calls against it. Um, and that's something that a lot of hedge funds do. Let's say you're in something for a very, very long time. You want to get those long term capital gains on it, but you think it might underperform maybe this quarter. You can sell calls against your actual actual shares and hedge your own position to collect premiums and then maybe add to your position with that and cost average, whatever you want to do. Um, but again, links in the description if you want to get more advanced into options. And then the final thing, which is just like a good thing about options is you have a lower capital requirement. Right, you're leveraging, which means to make, let's say, 10% profit, um, you can do that with a lot with a lot less money. So, let's say you have a thousand dollars. Right, if you were to put a thousand dollars into the stock price of Apple, um, and the stock price of Apple went up 10%, congrats, you made a hundred bucks. But if you took those one thousand dollars and you put them into options, um, and Apple went up 10%, those options would probably be up a few hundred percent, obviously depending on the strike price and the date and all those other things. But a 10% move is a pretty nice move for Apple in the short term, which would make you a lot of money. So basically with options, you can make a lot more profit with less money because they're more volatile. They give you higher percent returns if you're correct, but also they can give you a really, really bad loss if you're wrong. So again, it's just leverage. So it's not it's not only a good thing, but it can be looked at as a good thing if you want to make more money with less money, um, especially for those newer traders. Um, but yeah, that's the risk and reward. Now I want to talk about my personal process and really how I trade my options, which is going to be the bulk of this video. Um, a lot of the times my most common option trade will just be an out of the money call. When I'm very bullish on a stock going up in the mid to near term, I'll get out of the money calls on it. Um, if I'm not super, super bullish on the stock, but I still think that it has a decent probability of going up, I'll get the in the money calls, which again, lower risk, but also lower reward. Um, and pretty much the opposite if I'm bearish on the stock, I'll get out of the money puts. If I'm very bearish, I'll get in the money puts if I'm decently bearish. Now, when it comes to my position sizes, this is very important, okay? I've blown up accounts on options, but I've also taken accounts to 3000% profit on options. And you know, in terms of longevity, you really need to be position sizing correctly. If you're YOLOing options and putting your whole account into an option, it's I'm not going to say it's like straight up gambling, but it is insanely risky um, depending on how much that money means to you. So and this is not like any financial advice. I'm just telling you what I personally do um, for most of my accounts is I never put more than 10 to 15 percent of my account in options at a time, um, because what happens if the market has a big flash crash? and you had a bunch of calls, you know, there's just certain things that you cannot expect. Um, and if you were in options while those bad things happen, you can lose a lot of money very, very quickly and you might not ever get it back. It's not like if you're wrong about a stock and then you just have to bag hold it for a few months and eventually it goes back up. With options, if they're out of the money at the expiration date, you're going to lose whatever you paid for them and you're going to lose all of it. So. 10 to 15 percent of my account is something i'm worth risking in order to potentially gain a good amount on those options personally but everybody has their own risk tolerance so please the way to look at it is just like whatever you're comfortable with risking of your account risk that but literally tell yourself that if you lose that full amount like you'll be fine and if you don't think you'll be fine if you lose that full amount lower your amount of options that you have in your account now when it comes to the actual options trades I don't use stop losses on my options just because options are very, very volatile. And a lot of people I've talked to who use stop losses on their options, they get stopped out because the price went down a few percent, but the options went down like 40 percent. And then two minutes later, the price went back up and then those options were back in profit. So it's really, really easy to get stop hunted if you have stop losses on options, which is why I don't use them. Typically, I just use TradingView to set alerts on the price. And if a bad move happens, I'll just take myself out of the position. And again, like I said, I never put money into options that I'm not willing to risk the full amount on. But I usually like to cut around if I'm down 20 to 30 percent is when I pretty much that's pretty much my number on my position sizes for options. If I'm in an options contract and I'm down 20 to 30 percent, 
that's usually when I'll be getting out of those options. Sometimes I do hold it a little bit longer if I still am really bullish on the stock price and the, and the expiration date is far out enough for it to go back up. But typically I don't want to be losing more than like half of those options value because I'm trying to be profitable overall on options. So I need to, you know, if you lose 50% on something, you need the price to go back up double to just break even. So got to be careful with that. That's why 20 to 30% is usually where I cut my losses. And I average down on my options only until I'm down 15%. So if I'm in options, I'm completely fine averaging a little bit here and there until I'm down 15%. But after I'm down 15% on an option, I'm not going to average anymore. Basically, let's say I'm in an option, it goes down 15%. I was averaging, averaging, averaging. Then when it hits that 15% mark where I'm at a 15% loss, I stop averaging and I kind of let it go for a little bit. If it goes back up to break even, great. I might hold it. I might try and just break even on it. Um, but if it keeps dropping down to that 20 to 30% mark, that's when I just cut my loss. Because with options, you want to be very careful on cost averaging because, again, you can lose all the money you put into those options if a big move happens against what you were hoping for to happen. So always want to have a limit to how much you cost average on your options. It's not the same as stocks. Now, when it comes to reward, it's different here and there, but typically... I always set a price target for the price, like the actual stock price. Sometimes my price target is the actual strike price of my options. Sometimes my price target is above the strike price of my options. It depends. Um, but whenever my target price on the stock is achieved that I set before I entered my options, right there, no matter what, I take half of my options off the table. I take half my contracts off the table. Then the other half of my position, I scale. I might be scaling um, in more profits. I might be scaling with less profits, depending on if the price went up or down or whatever happened. Um, but really, I just make sure that if what I was hoping for happened, I'm going to be at least making some profit on it. So typically, if I take out half of my position, I'll for, sh I'll for sure be taking out my cost um, and then also a decent amount more. Um, but yeah. Now, when it comes to the type of trades that I do with options, for short term trades, I typically stick to large cap and indices just because I let's say I trust them more because when you a lot of these small cap names and stuff that you don't know the companies too well, but let's say you just like the chart a lot. A lot of the times I've had experiences personally where let's say an offering comes out or if it's like a healthcare stock, they have like a failed FDA approval or just some some sort of news catalyst that's not really predictable. Um, I don't that's why I don't really like using um, short-term trades on small and mid caps. So my short-term options trades, like my day trades on options, my weekly trades on options, typically will always be indices like the S&P 500 or the QQQ or the IWM, the Russell, or large cap stocks like Apple or Microsoft or Facebook and stuff like that, which typically don't have crazy bad uh, rug pulls, let's say. Now, um, that's what I do for day trades and for weekly trades, which means I'm entering the option where the expiration date is on the same week, which is a very high risk, high reward um, type of trade for options. Um, but when I'm looking for like a midterm swing trade, that's when I do like using the small and mid caps because typically the small caps and the mid caps um, can offer a, the actual stock prices move more, right? So they can offer a larger reward. Um, as long as obviously no bad news comes out or anything. And then for my super high conviction trades, that's the only time I do long-term options. Typically, if I'm doing, just to summarize everything, if I'm doing like a S&P 500 trade or if I'm trading Apple options, I'll do a pretty short-term option, which means the expiration date will be one to two weeks out. If I'm doing a, a swing trade on like a small cap or a mid cap, like a SPAC or an EV or pot stock, I'll have my expiration date like a month out and then let's say for any swing, whether it's a large cap, a small cap or whatever it is, if I'm super, super high conviction in it and it having like a huge move in the price, that's pretty much the only time I'll have my expiration date more than a month out. And again, none of this is financial advice. I'm just telling you what I personally do because it's my own system and I like the reward that I've gotten from it. Um, but obviously it comes with a lot of risk and also luck at the end of the day. So let's actually get into the charts. Let's talk about when I choose options, how I select my options and how I trade them. Um, before I actually get over to trading, I just want to give you some examples of options trades that I've made. Some of my biggest ones and my worst one. So I'm going to give you my three biggest option trades ever, and I'm going to give you one of my worst options trades. So let's actually start off from my third best option trade ever. 
which was QS Quantum Scape. This was a falling wedge with major hidden bullish divergence on the daily. I really like the fundamentals of the stock. I was super, super bullish on this and I got into an options um, trade on this. So I had a feeling that the price of QS could go up 46%, which is a lot for QS at the time. That's a huge move. So I was super, super bullish on QS going up and I got into options. They were out of the money options for about three weeks to four weeks out, like I said, and they, it worked out. Um, as you can see over here, um, I entered at about $47 and my target was $70. And as you can see, it's showing right now because now the price is under where it was there. But this trade did play out because as you can see, I entered right over here and it did go up to $69 before getting down to that stop loss area. So it hit the target before the stop loss. Just want to make it clear for people who don't understand trading view. Um, but yeah, the target played out. The price of the actual stock went up 46%. And here's the thing. I had options and those options went up thousands of percent. I'm not even joking because down over here, nobody was thinking that there was going to be a big move. The, the implied volatility was very, very low. The premium, the options were very, very cheap. But then a catalyst came out, the technicals played out. It worked out amazingly. And for literally doing nothing for like a couple of weeks, it went from $46 up to 70, which was a major move that 99% of people did not expect. Um, but I just felt like it was possible and thankfully it was. So that was one options trade that was huge for me. Another one was ABC, shout out to Guy and Hat. This was a very technical trade, but again, a catalyst ended up coming out, which worked in the favor of my options. There was hidden bullish divergence. You were at the 200 day moving average. There was like a down sloping channel. We even found like a bullish Gartley harmonic pattern. Again, it was a very high conviction trade. Um, and it played out. As you can see, the entry was about $97. The target was about 106. So, it was only a 10% move on the stock. So if I would have just gotten regular shares on this, I only would have made 10% profit. But I got into options and this is a very slow moving stock. So the implied volatility was very, very low. And what was only a 10% move in the actual stock price was again, over a 1000% profit for my options because it made a very quick move after doing nothing for a few weeks and just bleeding down slowly and slowly. It just made a huge move that 99% of people did not expect, which is why the options went crazy. And then finally, we had this Fisker um, white cough range where it was doing nothing for months and months and months, but it was nearing the end of this white cough range and I got into options. And again, it's going to show red because now the price is lower, but this trade did play out. It went up to the target, which was 2160 before ever getting down to the stop loss and it even went much, much higher. So another one that was over a 1000% profit, as you can see. If you're very, very confident in a stock going up because of technicals and your fundamental analysis, you can enter options. Don't be YOLOing them if you want to have longevity in trading, or you can make a nice position in options, something that you're worth risking to potentially make a 1000% profit trade if you're correct about a big move in a stock price. Now, keep in mind, these were my three best options trades ever, so they all were over a 1000% profit, but typically, most of my options trades that I do are like 50 to 100% profit. That's when I take a lot of profits. But those are three of my best trades. One of my worst trades was Clover. I felt the same way about this one that I did about the other three. Um, and I messed up on this one because I never cut my losses. So I talked about before how I like to cut my losses at 20 to 30%. Never cut my losses here. I entered the options. They were down 20 to 30%. But I still was like, it can still go up. It can still go up. And it just never did. It just got crushed. It went all the way down here. And I lost every single dollar that I put into those options. Um, the strike price was like a month out. And by the time they expired, it was like down over here. And I lost all that money. So now I'm just, you know, being straightforward. I don't like only showing wins. This was a huge loss um, on options. My position sizing was not great either. I did not use the 10 to 15% of my account. It was about like 20 or something. It was... Not great. So again, options can be amazing or they can be not good at all if you are YOLOing them. So please remember, it's all about consistency and managing your risk and not putting up money that you're not willing to risk, right? But those are just some examples of previous trades. I'm actually going to show you a few more recent options trades that I've made and give you some notes on my personal trading style for options. All right. So really what it comes down to with options and when I trade options, 
obviously I look for the highest probability setups, right? Why would I pick options over just a regular swing trade of the equity in the stock? It's because I really, really believe that the price is gonna go up. I either see a really, really good technical setup or I really fundamentally believe in the company. Um, that's when I do choose to use options. Now, when do I not trade options? When it's hard to tell the time frame of the trade, because again, like I said, not only do you have to be right about how much the options are going or how much the stock price is going to move, you have to be right about by when it's going to move. So when it's really hard to try and predict by when the stock price is going to move based on how quick the price currently is moving and you know just what stock it is, like obviously something like Apple will move a lot slower than like a small cap stock like Sundial um, or whatever you want to you know use for an example. So keep that in mind. And then another time I don't like using options is when it's just like a regular probability setup. When I'm confident that the trade can play out, but I'm not like super confident. Might as well just stick with an actual shares um, or trading the actual shares instead of options. Like, really, I want to have a very high conviction when I'm trading options and I want it to be clear about how the stock can move. I want to see how quickly the stock moves and I want to be able to analyze the chart and really tell myself that based on what I'm seeing in the past, I think there's a high probability that it will move this much by this time. That's when I look to use options. Um, and then another time I, I like using options is like, again, on those large cap stocks that move very, very slowly. I don't want to wait you know, a month to make a 10% profit on Apple. I'd rather use options and make hundreds of percent in profit when Apple moves up 10%. So for trades that I'm very confident in and trades that for stocks that move very, very slowly, that's when I like using options. Um, and then just like another thing, pretty much on the opposite side, when I don't like using options is when I want to be in an asset for a very, very long time. Like if I'm going to be in a long-term position, if I want to get long-term capital gains, I just do it in like actual share price because so many things can happen. If you're holding a, a stock for a long time, typically, um, you know, 90% of investors make money because they just wait long enough for their thesis to play out. Stocks will go up and down, but investors just wait for it to go up, right? But when you're a trader, you have to be right about not only the price and how it's, you know, if it's going to be moving up or down, but how much time it will take for that to happen. <clears throat> so if you're going to be really holding something like, let's say Fisker, and I want my long-term position, I'm not going to be doing leaps, which are like far out options. I'd rather just, personally, I'd rather just hold the actual stock. Now, another thing I like to do is day trade options, um, especially when it's really tough conditions for swinging in the market or doing swing trades with common stocks. Like let's say the S&P has been having a rough week or whatever it is and just a lot of stocks are not really getting continuation to the upside. That's when I'll day trade options. That's actually what I did last week. Um, there, there was just really, really rough value for swing trades. So I was just day trading options all week and it was a really rough week for the overall market and the NASDAQ, but I was really not holding much overnight and I was just tra trading the intraday moves um, with options and it worked out pretty, pretty well. So day trading options is another thing I like to do. You always want to have a limit to how much you do it because again, the high volatility, but it, it gives you more options, right? Kind of like pun intended options give you more options. Um, now with choosing, let's get in, like dive into what I choose, how I choose my options contracts. When I choose my contracts, I obviously want to be trading the time frame that I'm looking at. So if I'm analyzing the one hour chart, I'm probably going to be getting a shorter expiration date. If I'm analyzing the daily chart, I'm probably going to be getting a longer expiration date, like a month out. So the lower the time frame, the closer the expiration date, and the higher the time frame, the further out the expiration date. Um, and that's really how I, that's like the main way I look at the expiration dates. Another thing is I like to see the volatility of a stock. So I had this little method that I use. It might be a little bit confusing, but let's just kind of make it simple. Let me just go to a random stock. So let's say XL. And again, it's not financial advice. I just picked a, literally a random stock. You can see that XL has taken, let's use the date and price range tool. From this high to this low, it's taken about 60 days to fall 60%, okay? So in 60 days, it fell 60%. Let's say I'm entering a trade right over here where I want XL to be going up 30% and my target is a 30% gain, right? If I have a 30% gain and I set up a trade like this, where I got my three reward to risk that we talked about in the course, and this was my trade. If it took 60 days to go down 60%, do some simple math, 
if you're going to be averaging it out for this to go back up halfway or halfway in percent not halfway in the dollar in the dollar price but for it to go up pretty much half of 60 percent for it to go up 30 percent maybe it takes half the time that's right your percentage wise you're making half of that move you just made um so maybe it takes half the time so if i'm looking for this i might get a one month out call on excel um because i'm looking for a 30 percent gain if i'm looking for a 60 percent gain maybe i'll get the two month out calls because it did just take 60 get 60 days for it to fall 60 percent so i like using the date and price range tool on trading view analyzing the recent moves of the stock and just pretty much seeing how quickly or slowly it moves and then using some simple math to estimate how much it can take for it to replicate that move or do half of that move or a quarter of that move um, and that's one trick i use for finding my expiration dates and moving on let's talk about choosing my strike price like i said for the higher conviction trades i get out of the money calls for the decently predictions um or the decently probabilities i know it's terrible grammar but we've been like half an hour into this video by now or something if i'm like less bullish but i still am bullish i'll be in the money on my calls um and when it comes down to my stop loss like i said 20 to 30 percent so just summarizing some points let's actually look at a few more of my recent trades on options and i'll talk about what options i chose and how they worked out all right so Let's come over here to IWM first. Let's go down to the one hour. Like I said, I'm trading the one hour here. So if I'm trading the one hour, typically I'll have a shorter expiration date because the one hour moves much quicker. Wow, I really cannot speak right now. I just said quicker. The one hour moves much quicker. Um, so I'm I was looking at this stock right over here. I really liked that it had a lot of good technical variables. Um, you had a bullish cipher, a falling wedge, a double bottom, bullish divergence, all the things that I like to see on my options trade it had on this chart. So this is how I set up my options on IWM. This was literally last week. Um, we had all the technical variables and this was my buy signal, this little bullish pin bar right over here. So that was my buy signal and I entered right over here in my target, just like a regular technical trade target. I targeted the golden retrace of the falling wedge. So my target was right over here and that my stop loss was right under the lows so very nice reward to risk about a four reward to risk on this trade i entered my options down over here at 213 my target was 220 and my stop loss not my actual stop loss on the options but where i was going to be getting out of my options at was if it came down to 211 that was how i was looking at my options right i was waiting to take profits on my options until it got up to my target 220 on the actual price and I entered at 213 on the actual price. Um, and if the price did go the other way and it came down to 211, I would get out of my options. So I use the actual stock price to kind of go about when I'm gonna be taking profits or cutting losses on my options. Um, I don't really, I care more about what the stock price is doing for setting up my risk to reward than about the premium price. But obviously you're trading the premium price on those options. Um, and this trade worked out great. I shared it with the premium members. I went up about 40% in two days. I believe I got the, actually on this one, I did get further out calls. I got like three week out calls um, for the 215 strike price. And the reason I actually went further out on the expiration date, even though it's a one hour chart that I'm trading and it's an index, um, was simply because of the really, really rough market conditions last week. So it was just more about like the actual market itself. But typically if the market was in normal conditions, I would be getting shorter term expiration dates and in hindsight i definitely could have I actually would have made a lot more money if i got shorter expiration dates um because like i said before the shorter the expiration date the higher the risk and the higher the reward so obviously the reward came out over here and it would have been higher but profits always profit so um i entered at 213 i got the 215 calls for a month out and my target was 220. so from pretty much from 213 to 215 uh, the calls were not in the money. They were out of the money. So they were out of the money calls, but then they became in the money once they got over 215. And one thing I really did notice is from 215 to 220 is when the options, like the premium was actually really, really going up very nicely. When it was actually out of the money, it was not going up that, the options premium were not going up that quickly. I don't know, maybe just because of the implied volatility or just how people are feeling about the market. But this ended up working out nicely and that's how I chose the price. I wanted to do out of the money because I was very confident in it going up because of the technicals. 
and I chose about three weeks out for the expiration date just because of the market conditions. Another trade that I did last week, or actually on Friday, was DraftKings. Now this is kind of a bit weird, but I was using the daily as my buy signal, but I was using the one hour as my trade, if that makes sense. My buy signal was actually on the daily where it was at the pattern completion zone of a bullish bat and also a bullish deep crab at the same time. And that was just a really bullish signal to me. And the market was also having a nice open on Friday. So I got into DraftKings calls. Let me actually pull up what they were because I don't exactly remember. So the calls I got into this were the May 21st, $42 calls. So on this, I got calls one week out for $42. So if we come down over here, I entered DraftKings pretty much right at 42. So really I got in at the money. So I entered my $42 calls when DraftKings was at $42 and my expiration is next Friday. So one week out and that's a pretty high risk, high reward bet. I was pretty much saying that really within the next few days, DraftKings will go up and it will not go down. That's the bet I pretty much took. And thankfully it went up 10% on the same exact day and the options went up 89%. So I made 89% profit on a 10% move in the price or an 8% move in the price from where I entered. And the reason that I chose next week's options is because the buy signal was literally right there on Friday and the market was green. So I'm using technicals, I'm using multiple time frames, I'm using overall market sentiment, price volatility, I'm using so many different factors to decide if I'm gonna be getting an in the money call, an out of the money call, and when my strike price will be. You wanna bring as many factors into your options trade as possible. So that's DraftKings, huge trade on Friday, another one is BlackBerry. And there was, again, I was actually getting my buy signal off of larger time frames, right? But the larger time frames were telling me that right there and then on Friday, it was going to start going. And that's what happened. It went up 6%. And this was really where I entered on BlackBerry. I entered right down over here at pretty much $8. And it went up to $8.45. So it went up 6%. And the options went up about 40%. And I got the $7.5 strike. For next Friday. So just like DraftKings, I pretty much got the at the money strike price um, for next Friday, which means that I was literally saying DraftKings within the next few days will go up and not down or BlackBerry in the next few days will go up, not go down. And at least for yesterday, it did. So it was started up off 40% in profit. And again, I was looking at those larger time frames for my buy signal, but that was just because that's where I got the high probability answer from. But typically, like I said earlier, if you're going to be trading the daily, that's when you get out like the longer expiration dates. So please do not take this as me telling you that if you're getting a buy signal on the daily to get weekly options, I only did it for these two trades because the market was very green on Friday and even the low time frames did look good in hindsight, right? If we look at the RSI, you did have bullish divergence on the one hour. You also did have it on the MACD and it was kind of at the 200 day moving average. So I was not only getting my buy signal on the daily, I was also getting on the four hour, the one hour, the 30 minute. I believe it also broke over the VWAP. Yup, it was riding up the VWAP all day. So I actually had these on my watch list as swing trades, but I just saw a really, really good opportunity for a short term options trade in them. So please kind of take that from what I'm saying. Don't take me um, telling you, I'm not telling you to uh, get weekly options on something that you're getting a buy signal from the daily on. That's not what I typically do. It just happened to work out here because of the low time frames also looking good. But I just got my buy signal where I got my buy signal and it worked out. Now, this is like a true um, option, like one of a very common options trade I will do where I got my buy signal on the low time frames and I just day traded it. So on the one hour on Facebook, I saw that there was heavy options flow using Tradedix. I went onto my Tradedix platform right over here. And I went over to the live options flow and I saw that on Facebook. This was like in the middle of last week, so you won't be able to see it now. But basically, I just saw that there was huge bets coming in on, on Facebook. And I looked at the chart. There was classic bullish divergence on the one hour. There was a bullish bat pattern. And it also broke the VWAP over here. And this was my Facebook trade. Um, let's see. I think I got the 305 Facebook calls 
for literally like two days out because I was playing that it was going to move up like today. I was day trading it. So last Wednesday, I got calls for Friday. So on Wednesday morning, I got in Facebook. The price was about 302 and or let me see, May 12th. May 12th, this was, yeah, Wednesday. So I got in at about 302 and my strike price was 305 by Friday. I said that literally within two days, I think Facebook is gonna go up $3 and they did that on the same exact day. And then the next morning I actually took profits. I overnighted them just because the market was down so much on Wednesday that I felt that I was gonna go up the next day. And then Facebook actually gapped up the next morning and I took profits right away. And I walked away with about a 90% profit because again, I had weekly options. So it was a high risk, high reward trade. It happened to work in my favor where by Thursday, it was already $5 in the money because um, my strike was 305 for Friday and on Thursday it was at 310. So I took my profits and it did go a lot higher. I could have made probably another 50% in profit because I went all the way to 315. But again, profits profit, especially on like short term options trades, you want to be taking your profit when you get them just because if it just starts pulling back, it's gonna, the options premiums are going to drop very, very quickly because again, the strike, the expiration date is so close. So super, super high volatility on close expiration dates. And those were three of my really good trades from last week. DraftKings, BlackBerry, and Facebook made huge trades off of them. Um, I, I used the, all the time frames as my buy signals. I had a very high confidence in all of them. I used the overall market sentiment. I used options flow. The more data you have, the better it is. So I was using so many different resources for my theory or my thesis on these trades. They ended up working out and I made a very nice amount of money off of them. And that's what can happen if you're right on options, especially um, if you take those high risk, high reward options, which again, I'm not telling you to do. Um, weekly options are like kind of like you have to be right. If you're not right, like within literally hours, you can lose a lot of money. So. I actually would not recommend you copying any of these um, short term trades if you're starting out just because it takes a lot of skill. And obviously there was a very high risk if they didn't work out because they could have dropped very, very quickly. And that was the same case on AMD. So I'm actually gonna be showing you a options trade from last week that did not work out. Um, so this was AMD and i got into options right over here at about 74 dollars it was pretty much like all the other trades i just showed you where i got the uh pretty much one to two week out options at the money which pretty much means i was saying it was going to be going up above the current price within the next few days and it did not the market pulled back it fell under the vwap and it dropped like two or three percent but my options dropped like 30 percent which like i said earlier was my risk number i don't like having over a 30 percent loss on options so I cut them. So this was a pretty big loss. It was my biggest loss of the week. Lost 30% on those options. And then the market went up the next day and this pretty much went right back up. So I could have broken even. So that's that's the tough part about options, you know. It's not always going to be easy. I cut my losses at a 30% loss and then literally the next day it went right back up. Um, but if it did not go back up the next day, these probably would have been down 100% because it was way below the strike price and the expiration date was pretty close. So you live to fight another day. You're going to make a lot, a lot of mistakes trading options, especially if you're day trading them, which is why you really have to have a good risk management strategy. If you don't have a good risk management strategy. It's going to be very, very tough because even if you have four good trades in a row on one bad trade, you can lose all the profits you made on those four good trades. Um, and that's why I really encourage you to find a good system to trade with fake money like paper paper trading until you actually find a profitable method in options um, like I said earlier I've literally blown up accounts on options that I were YOLOing the accounts on and just putting the whole entire uh, portfolio size into one call option that didn't work out and I never cut my losses but at the same time I've taken accounts up to 3,000 percent profit um, just compounding profits on options and you know doing it correctly and having good position sizes and not being cocky. So I just showed you a lot of short term options trades just because especially for the premium trades that I've been putting out recently in this really hectic market, I've been doing a lot of short term options trades. Typically, like I said earlier, when it's hard to swing trade, I just day trade options and that literally saved my week last week um, because I made a lot of money day trading options. 
while a lot of uh, swing trades that I put out did not do too well because the Nasdaq fell like 6% in three days, which was wild. So I was only giving you examples of like my day trades and like short term trades for options. But please remember that these are not um, typical options trades that uh, have the same probability there. It's a lot harder to make money trading short term options than it is longer term options just because you have to be right very, very quickly. You don't really give yourself that much time for your thesis to play out like it has to play out right away. So just kind of use these ideas, but for longer time frame trades on your options, I'm not encouraging anybody to be trading lottos, which pretty much just means weekly options. You really have to be at a high level to do that. All right. So take this as education for the longer term options trades. I was just using these as examples because they were my most recent options trades just because of how weird the market was last week. I didn't want to be in long term options. I just wanted to get in and get out of my options very, very quickly and it ended up working out. But with all of that said, and I also did show you some of my longer term options trades from the past that were huge winners, 1000% profit. So just to clear everything up, no, nothing I said in this video was financial advice. Um, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just trying to share my personal strategy with you. Um, really, if you want to be making money off of options, there are no shortcuts. You need to learn, learn, learn and put in a lot of practice with low risk. Like. If you, if you really haven't traded options yet, start out very, very small until you start making consistent profit. Do not go big in options until you start having a good plan and until you start seeing it working. All right. Um, so be careful. If you're not confident in your ability to trade options, nobody is forcing you to trade options. Doesn't mean you're a bad trader if you can trade options. It's not for everybody. It is not easy to see positions down 30% within hours. So remember to manage your risk, position size, and never put down money that you're not willing to risk. All right. Be safe. Learn, learn, learn. And good luck to all of you in your trading journeys, whether it's options or not. Hopefully this video gave you some education. That's what I hoped for. Probably my longest video I've ever made just because of how complicated options can be. But honestly, there were so many points that I missed in this video. So check out the links in the descriptions if you want more options videos that I would recommend that are a bit longer than this one that dive more into all the terms and, you know, the specifics and the strategies and everything. But I just wanted to make an options video tailored towards my personal process and how I, you know, put on trades and what's worked for me in the, in the past few months. So, yeah, thank you for watching the video. If you're not subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button. Um, I stream every single weeknight at 9 p.m. EST, so I'll see you there and have a good day. Peace out.